Is there like a like like for some people they'll say, well, my cholesterol, my my total cholesterol is four hundred and fifty, my LDL is three hundred and fifty. Is there a number where you say that's just too much for me, I can't handle that, or, or do you just say, let me just look at the other factors and how, how do you how do you approach some of these? You know, like Dave Feldman talks about these lean mass hyper responders where it's literally skyrockets. I mean, you see sometimes total cholesterol is six seven hundred. Do you get those patients and how do you deal with them? Yes, we do get those patients and they are lean mass hyper responders. Lots of them, there also can be hyper responders. And uh, it's interesting, uh, you know, we have patients that want to come in and go on a carnivore diet. And I said, you know, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. I, I almost guarantee that your LDL cholesterol is going to shoot through the roof. And then we have to, you know, decide whether that's at, at risk or not. And so, um, we look at all the metabolic markers. And uh, again, if the ratios look good, if uh, the, the insulin levels, the hemoglobin A1C look good, which generally they do, then uh, it may not be uh, an issue. And it just may be a response to this, this you know, higher protein, higher in fat uh, diet. Now, you know, the, always the issue comes up, well, do they have um, familial hypercholesterolemia? And the only way to check that is to do uh, genetic testing and they can be, you know, uh, monozygous or homozygous. And so that means basically they have one of the, one of the two alleles. And if, if you're really, um, a true FH and you're homozygous, you, you really do have a risk of, of uh, cardiovascular disease at a young age. And those people usually weed themselves out. And it's a very low percentage of the population that they're actually a home, you know, um, homozygous. And so uh, some of the patients may be monozygous where the uh, LDL, let's say, if you go over, if it's over 300, perhaps you, you might want to think that they might be homozygous for FH, but, but that doesn't really increase the risk of, of uh, heart disease. And uh, I, I have to tell you, I mean, we had a, a patient come in just this week who had an LDL at, at 490, but all the other markers looked well. And... Uh, you know, the question is like these patients, these individuals, they sometimes go to other doctors and, you know, the doctors think we're crazy or the patient's crazy. And so how do you address the high cholesterol with the other healthcare professionals? Because they're colleagues and friends in the community and um, we don't want to um, offend or say, say things different in terms of lifestyle and diet. So we have to address that carefully and, and, um, for some patients, look, there are ways to bring down LDL cholesterol. Well, I, I don't think that it necessarily reduces risk, but it reduces the cardiologist's um, anger or fear that the patient's going to have some adverse outcome of the high LDL. And so, you know, the thing is, and, and this is good advice long term, that um, um, I think that the fat intake um, is regulated by satiety. So backing down on fat intake um, can be one way to bring down LDL cholesterol. Um, if if you're if you're satiated, you're not going to need as much food anyway. So that's that's one way to bring it down. I think uh, I don't have a problem with you know the monounsaturated fats, olive oil and avocado oil. So there are ways to bring it down, but it, it's just so we can say, well, okay, the number looks better. I don't think it's going to reduce your cardiovascular risk, however. Yeah, I mean, the interesting about monounsaturated, you know, if you look at pork, for instance, it's, it's quite high in monounsaturated fat, as is prime beef, particularly Wagyu, things like that. They, they tend to tend to, you know, it's, I learned a lot about meat science and, you know, the subcutaneous fat tends to be more concentrated and saturated and the marbling, which tastes good, tends to be higher in monounsaturated. So that's kind of an interesting. And the other thing is controversial, grain fed tends to steer more towards monounsaturated versus a, a grass finished animal, which is also Kind of an interesting thing there. So these people that come in with this high cholesterol, I mean, you look at everything else, and is there additional monitoring you might do if, if you decide that they're they're not you know at risk? Are you saying let's let's check something periodically, whereas you wouldn't check it with somebody with say a more quote unquote normal cholesterol? How does that how does that work? Yeah, well, it's funny as as I go on in my medical career, I I still think the simple is best, and so. We, we used to do a lot of advanced lipid testing and, and um, I, I find that if we just look at the simple lipid ratios, a standard lipid profile, where we get a uh, triglyceride to HDL ratio, if that's less than two to one, you can 
uh, almost guarantee with 99% certainty that you're going to have the large particles. So why do the advanced lipid testing? And that's regardless of how high the LDL is uh, or not. So um, uh, yeah. So again, just 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 simple testing. And um, if they're um, age 45 in male in males or 50 in women, we can get the uh, the heart imaging, the heart calcium score to look at risk. And sometimes we do it uh, in, in younger individuals if, if they really do have a very high LDL. Yes, it's one of those things. I, I think I had a CA score. I think I was, I'm 55 and I think I had it when I was 52 after, you know, keto for many years and carnival for a couple of years. And mine was zero, thankfully. Um, do you find, and, and the criticism is always, well, you're loaded with soft black. You know, you clearly, I mean, you, you have to be having all this soft black. And I'm like, well, I mean, I, I do pretty well. I don't think my heart cardiac function is compromised. Do I need to follow up with an angiogram? How often are you finding zero CAC scores in asymptomatic, asymptomatic individuals that are loaded with soft plaque? Is that, is that, does that happen frequently, less frequently? My, 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 in reading the literature, it seems like a zero CAC score is going to make you less likely to have soft plaque just across the board anyway. But what's your experience? Yeah, we, you know, I love to talk about this, this stuff, Sean. And so um, I've been a, a, a fan of uh, coronary artery calcium scores for several years. In fact, um, I've sometimes thrown myself into the machine. I've had four now and I'm 61 years of age. And luckily I, I still uh, have a zero score. And, you know, I've been doing um, low carbon keto for over 20 years now. So um, I'm happy to report that uh, as of today, my heart has not exploded yet. So, um, yeah, and uh, it, it's a, those are really great questions about is, is, is the calcium score the only thing you need and what about the soft plaque? So, uh, as you know, we also have these conferences that I mentioned and uh, we have a uh, really one of the field experts in calcium scores, Dr. Karam Nasir, who has just agreed to uh, speak at our conference next year. And he's, I, I believe he's one of the uh, cardiologists that uh, created the term, the power of zero. So meaning if you have a zero score, your 10, 10 to 15 year risk of having an event is less than 2%. Um, yeah, and, and, and the literature actually refers to it as a warranty that you're, you're gonna be healthy. But Karam continues to, to do research and he's looking at this with Arthur Agatston, you know, he's, he basically is the name behind the Agatston score and um, others are, are doing research. And uh, I think there was just a paper that came out where they were looking at the, cal the zero calcium score and they followed it up with CT angiogram looking at um, soft plaque. So it is true that uh, a small percentage of individuals with a zero calcium score will have soft plaque. And the, and the only way to see that is to do it advanced imaging, such as a CT angiogram, we put a little, a little bit of dye into the blood vessel and uh, just a little bit more invasive, a tiny bit more radiation. And then you can, you can see the, the, the soft plaque. And uh, the study shows that the, um, the calcium score by itself is still very predictive of not having events. Uh, and there, uh, and, and and there are smaller percentage of individuals that, that do have soft plaque that is both non-obstructing and obstructing, uh, but very, very small percentages. So Karam will uh, hopefully talk about that a little bit more. So I have patients again, that are very well-informed and it, it's fun to have conversations with them and they get a calcium score and, and, and then they wanna follow up with a CT angiogram. And um, we're, we're trying to tease that out. like you know, the calcium score isn't a test to get additional testing. We want to make that clear. And even the cardiology uh, uh, friends and colleagues don't quite understand that. And so um, I think perhaps if you have a very high calcium score, maybe, you know, over 400 or a thousand, um, you know, for the bio geeks, perhaps a CT angiogram might be indicated, but I, I really tell people if if you're asymptomatic, meaning you don't have any uh, chest pain or, or exercise induced discomfort or shortness of breath, um, I still feel that just the calcium score by itself is, is adequate. It's just the individuals that, you know, and, and 
you know, I'm picking on the men. Men are really stubborn. They de deny symptoms, but you really have to quiz and, and interview uh, individuals and say, look, have you ever had, uh, you know, a, a symptom in your chest or you were short of breath or it was something after exercise? And, you know, if they had a high calcium score, I, I mean, I just jump and, and they get a cardiac workup. So that's how we uh, deal with that. Do you 